before I get started, I want to point out that there will be an extended example in this talk. And if after the talk is over, you'd like to play around with it, it's all available from my GitHub under the DTH repository. So you can find the code there. OK, so I'm going to be talking about dependent types in Haskell today. And um, uh, one thing I'm ah. And so I should start by explaining my title, right? So just to be very clear, um, what I want to talk about today is how dependent type theory has influenced the design of some of the features in Haskell and what we can do with some of those features now. And so just to, to be clear, what is dependent type theory? That's, it's, it's this mathematical thing. It's this foundation of mathematics that goes back to Martin Locke. Now, if you went to the first invited talk at ICFP this morning, you got a fabulous introduction to math and Martin Locke type theory by Andre Bauer. And so, it, but if you, even if you didn't, it could be a little bit confusing. You know, why, how does this foundation of logic relate to programming? Right? And, it, and it does because, um, because of this connection that's called the Curry-Howard isomorphism. This idea that when you have, in, in type theory, we're going to be representing um, uh, proofs as programs and propositions as types. So any type programming language, we can start to think about not just as a type th programming language, but also through its relationship to logic. And that's a natural translation scheme, something that I want to take advantage of. Now the other thing is, what is Haskell? And, and um, I don't quite know the background of all of you here, but just in case, um, it's a research program, it started as a research programming language. It's been around for some time, but it's got a fair number of industrial users, hobbyists, hobbyists educators. I use it in my teaching at Penn. I know many people who use it in, to do real work, and um, but it's an influential language, right? Um, it's a source of inspiration for many new programming languages that are coming out there, and many existing programming languages. I've seen them adopt features that were first explored in the context of Haskell. So what it is is it's a playground for programming language ideas in a way where we can really experiment with them, right? Okay, so dependent types in Haskell. What does this mean, right? And um, you know, you, well, we can see that Haskell is very much, you know, it's influenced by the lambda characters, by these ideas from logic. But, um, you know, fitting dependent types, it's not quite an easy fit, right? So there's going to be some rough edges going on, right? And, and there's a lot of hype out there about dependent types in programming. So I, this, I did this Google search, right? So, you know, clearly, dependent types are already in Haskell. What is there to do, right? And you can go out and see a lot of blogs about how, you know, why dependently typed programming will one day rock your world? You know, the future of programming is dependent type. That's true, right? But what does it mean, right? And so the point of this talk is to actually, you know, to de deconstruct what dependently typed programming means and kind of give you a vision of how it can look like today in Haskell and maybe even what it will look like in languages in the future. Right, so what I, I'm, I'm using this phrase called dependent Haskell. And um, that's not really a thing. Um, what, it, what I mean by dependent Haskell is um, the Glasgow Haskell compiler, specific Haskell compiler, it has a lot of experimental language features. And if you put enough of them together, <laughs> you, <laughs> you can pretend you have a dependent like, type language. Um, right. So why would you want to do that? Right. And this is where I'm going to demonstrate through an extended example. Right? And, and one reason why I want to have dependent types in Haskell is Haskell has this fabulous type system, and it's great for expressing I, uh, constraints about my programming to help me understand what my programming is, help me to, to drive how my programming works. I would like to make that type system specific to the domain I'm working in. Right? And so what I would like to be able to do is use the capabilities of dependent types to make my type <coughs> checking better fit the domain I am programming with. Right, so here's an example. Um, so we're going to work through a, a simple Haskell program that is going to uh, work with regular expressions. Right, and so you can use regular expressions for parsing if, you're, if you want. Um, 
So say I have a, a, a string like this, and I want to, it looks like a, a file <coughs> name and a full file path. And maybe I want to recognize that this is the name of some file on my disk. This is actually the source Haskell file. And maybe I want to find out um, the parts of this string. Right? I might want to know that the, the base name of the file is example, and that it's a Haskell file, so its extension is .hs. And, and it's in some directory structure. So there might be multiple directories, and I want to pull them out. And so there's this idea out there of regular expression capture groups, a way of describing how I can take strings and decompose them in this way. Right. And um, what you get as a result of recognizing this, you don't just understand that the regular expression matches the string, but you also get a dictionary that gives you access to what the base name is and the extension and the directories. And the challenge for today is, can we tell our type system what it means to have a capture group? Right, so that the type system can make sure that that dictionary we get corresponds to the regular expression that we started with. Okay, so um, what what regular expression are we going to use for the example I just showed you? Right, so um, we want to write a regular expression that's going to recognize and parse this kind of string in this way. So, what kind of regular expression is it going to look like? Right, so it's going to start. Um, maybe there's a slash at the beginning, so this is just regular expression syntax. I stole this syntax from, I think, Python syntax for regular expression <coughs> capture groups. So it's going to start, maybe there's a slash at the beginning. Now we want to say there is any number of directories, so a directory is any character that isn't a slash, followed by a slash, there's a lot of them. We're going to name them the question mark P, that's creating, naming the capture group. DIR is the name of the directories that we're going to capture in the capture group in that resulting dictionary. Right, so we have part of our regular expression is for the directories. Um, that's, the, that's the actual capture group syntax. The, followed by that, after the directories, we have the base name, and we're also going to name that. And then finally, we have the extension, right, and so we're going to name that. Maybe there's not an extension there, so it's, it's optional whether a file has an extension or not. Right? And so let's, let's try it out. So I just want to show you how this works in Haskell today so you can see what the type system is doing for me. So we'll go over to Emacs. Right? So here I have my module, um, a couple of language extensions. Just, um, here's my module. This is the, at the top there, that's the regular expression I just walked through um, that for our capture groups. Here's the file name, and I'm going to call this function match. That's actually going to take that regular expression and match it against the file name. Because I've done the demo before, I know it will succeed and give me a dictionary. And then I want to look up the various parts from that dictionary. Okay, so here, let's load it. I will, let me move it down so you can see what happens. Right, so um, let's hope this works. Right, so I can look up the base name, so that's example. I can look up the, the list of strings that are the, all of the, um, the directories. And it will tell me that, yes, there is indeed an extension, and it is .hs. Now, what's remarkable about this? Right? I'm just constructing a dictionary. But if you know a little bit about Haskell, the Haskell has to keep track of the types of everything. right? So it has to know that what, what is the type of x. Right? It has to know that when I look up ba the string base from this dictionary, right, I'm going to get a string. But when I look up dir from the dictionary, I'm going to get a list of strings. And when I look up z, x, I may or may not get a string. Right? So I'm putting my cursor over the declarations, and my IDE is telling me the types that have been inferred for these different components. So it's able to figure out you know, what these axes is. I'm getting a very heterogeneously typed data structure. And the type checker is making sure that I'm using that data structure correctly. Now let's try to misuse it. 
right? So, right, what happens if I take that dictionary and I try to access something that doesn't correspond to that capture group at all, right? There's no capture group that's called F. Okay, so, I'm gonna, so I uncommented this line, I'm gonna reload the file. So reload, and I get an error message, a compile time message that says, I can't find that capture group, right? <laughs> hey, Bob, <laughs> there's no capture group named F inside. Here are the capture groups that you can actually access, right? And so this is what I, this is really what I mean by domain specific type checking. This is an error message that's coming at compile time. It's directly using the um, constructs of the domain that I'm working in. It's talking about capture groups. It's even talking about where I'm giving the talk today. It's that specific, <laughs> um, right? And, um, and I'm doing that because I have this programmatic access to the type system. Okay. So let me comment this, reload it, and then switch back to the rest of the talk, which is basically how in the world can we do this? Okay, that's just in case everything fails. Okay, we want to do that, but how do we do that? And you could think, well, it's, it's of course it's dependent types. But what do we really need from the dependent types to do something like that? You know, what are we asking for? Right, and I kind of broke this talk up into just like four different things that we're gonna get from Haskell to be able to implement this. And these are four things that are directly inspired by dependent type systems, right? That Haskell has kind of adopted to be able to do examples like this. And I've read them in this font that's a little bit hard to read because I read somewhere that if you, have to, if you have to work a little bit to read text, you're gonna retain it more. <laughs> These are the important parts of the talk. <laughs> okay, so the first thing, type computation. We want to be able to write programs in our types, right? And, and that's, that's kind of key, right? We're using the type system to implement a domain-specific compile time thing, so we have to implement it somehow, right? And so we, you saw some computation going on. You know I must have written some code, right? So what code did I write? So the first bit of code is actually, you know, when you look at path, I didn't show you this, but if you ask GHC, what is the type just of this regular expression I constructed, right? It's a very informative type, right? It says this path is a regular expression, but it's not just any regular expression. It's a regular expression with three different capture groups. They have three different names. This one is only gonna capture one string. This one is gonna capture any number of strings. This one may or may not capture a string, right? And that is the information that we need when we, pack, when we match against this regular expression to know what kind of dictionary we're gonna get out, to know what the types of all of the, all of the entries in the dictionary are, right? So that, that information is already computed from the regular expression itself. So how do we go from that to that type? So, and, and this, this stuff right here, this is just, this is kind of Haskell data. This is a Haskell list. These are Haskell pairs. This is a, ha this wants up many, this is just a Haskell data type I defined, but I'm using them in the type language. All right, and so how do we get, how do we, how do we go from there to there? <coughs> right, so the first part, well, I had to use this uh, Python regular expression syntax. Right, and so I used a tool that's called template Haskell, that's what these brackets are, just to do a little bit of compile time parsing, to be able to parse this regular expression and turn it into a definition that's just a bunch of combinators applied to arguments to construct the regular expression. This is not really magic, this is just parsing, but it allows us to use this nice syntax instead of defining all the regular expressions with the combinators. The important part is the types of these combinators, right? When I say I have um, here, you know, I have an optional character followed by a star, uh, any, a sequence of a marked capture group that looks like this, followed by a slash, 
right? The types of these combinators, R opt, R seek, R star, R mark, that's where that's going to be doing the type level computation, right? So, um, so when we when I define my library that uses those combinators, it's going to say like each of these combinators, their types say what kinds of capture groups they're constructing, right? So if a, a character doesn't capture anything, so its capture group list, right, it's empty. Um, a sequence, you know, this one is going to capture some things, that one is going to capture some things, then I have to merge together the information about what is captured by the two different things. Same for all of the others. And these merge and repeat, um, this is saying when I mark something, here's where I've actually found something that I'm marking, I'm going to merge it into the other stuff. So say, say repeat. Let's look at what repeat does. Well, repeat, right, repeat says whatever cap is captured by this subreddit expression, now I'm going to do it any number of times, right? So what that means is I, I write a small functional program that goes over this list of the names and the occurrences, right, and um, anything, all the occurrences, is just turning them into many. Because it's underneath a star, we know it could now occur many times. Maybe we're not capturing anything by that star, we're just going to get the empty list. But anything that we are capturing could now be captured many times. Right? And that's it. Right? It's just functional programming to explain how that works, to calculate from that regular expression what its captured groups are. Okay, so I'm give a little quick demo here. Um, down here, I have a couple of regular expressions, <coughs> and, um, and I can just show you. I don't even have to run it. <coughs> I just have to put my mouse over the definition, and down here, that, right, I don't know if you can see in the back, but um, the type, here, I'll just type it here, right, the type of the first one, right, that's just a capture group that, um, marks A, but it's any sequence of characters. So it says so there's one A, right? The, the, the A is marked around the star, right? And B, RB is one B, right? And then, um, let's see if I move this up a little bit more so you can see in the back. Um, we, when we start to put them together, things like uh, RC is, are gonna combine them together, so so X1, right, is an RB followed by an RA. So we're going to capture two things. We're going to capture a B and an A. And our type says, look, we're going to capture an A and a B. Why aren't they in the same order? Well, the dictionary that we're constructing that describes the capture groups, it needs to have a normal form. So it's going to alphabetize all of the names that it sees as it computes it together. Um, if we alternate, okay, think about what this one is going to be. So example two, it's either, we're either going to capture an A or we're going to capture a B followed by an A. Right, so what, what what's going to be the type of X2? Right, well it says that we know every time we're going to capture an A, sometimes we're going to capture a B. Right, so we have to figure out how to merge those two, how to alternate. And then finally, um, here, here's star again. What happens if we're going to, oh, there's the answer. <laughs> right, we have an A followed by a B, and then we repeat it. Right, so A followed by B, which is A once, B once. When we repeat it, we get A many times and B many times. Right, it's just writing functional programming to compute from this regular expression, which we know at compile time. We can then compute at compile time what the dictionary is going to look like if it succeeds. Okay. So that's the first thing, is being able to write that kind of computation. Um, what else? Well, we need to be able to make sure, so when we match, we're going to get a dictionary that is indexed by the same type. That's going to say what the, we need to be able to say if this dictionary that we get from pattern from doing the regular smashing, if it's indexed by that type, it really is a dictionary that has a string for base 
a list of strings for dir and a maybe for oft, right? We need this type to be meaningful. We need it to constrain the value that we have. So our bet, second bit of information is a way to make that connection between the types and force the types to constrain what the values are. All right. And we need that because that allows us to, when we look up at compile time, we look at fields at compile time, we absolutely know that there's going to be this field there. Right? And if we try to look up things that aren't there, we absolutely know it won't be there. And that, so this is what allows us to do this without checking that that field is there and provide compile time errors when it isn't. Right, so um, how do we do that? Um, so this type is going to put a constraint on what the dictionary is going to look like. And this is a very simple uh, representation of the dictionary. It's just a list of all the values in it. Right, so if that dictionary has that type, we know it has to look something like this. Right? It has to be three different entries, one for base, one for dir, one for x. We don't, it doesn't have to be exactly this string, it could be any string, but it has to be a string. This one has to be any sequence of strings. This has to be any maybe string, but it has to be that. Notice that this dictionary, doesn't, it's only storing the values. It doesn't need to store the keys. Why? Because we know where everything is. The type tells us exactly what order all of the values are stored in the dictionary. Right, so. We know that this is, and that's how we can resolve all of the lookups at compile time. Right. And we do this using a feature of DHC of Haskell called Gaddits, a way of defining data types in Haskell where they're indexed by other types, and the types sort of constrain. So a dictionary that's indexed by the empty list, right, can't capture anything must be the empty dictionary. We, we're not storing anything here. Otherwise, if we have a dictionary that has an entry for something, right? well, we better have that entry at the beginning of the list and then maybe some other entries later on in the list. Right? So the way we have defined this data structure for dictionaries is what makes that connection between the type and <coughs> representation. Okay. Um, we also use another feature, so not just Gaddis, we also use another feature called type families to constrain data. Right, so each entry in our dictionary, right, it's over here, right, each entry, right, is going to be computed <coughs> from right, what the name is and this O, right, this was many, once, or, or oct. Right? And we need to know what type of entry are we going to put there. Right? And so we're going to compute that um, by, um, by this type family over here. This is just another way, just like we saw merge before. It's a way of writing functions at the type level. We're going to compute that OT, the occurrence type, by just mapping, well, if we see something once, we're going to record it with a string. If we see it in optionally we're going to record it with a maybe string, right? So we do a little bit of type level programming here that also is going to tell us more about how our data representation works. Right, and notice um, this definition for entry, right? Again, the, the key, it appears in the type, but it's not appearing anywhere in the value, the, the values that we're storing in the entries. Okay. So that was two. So the first one was type level computation, being able to write programs in your types. The second one was using the type level value types to constrain how values are represent, represented. The next idea that I want to talk about is kind of, is, is really getting to the heart of what dependently type programming is, right? Um, having data in types and in runtime, and we're going to use that data in two different ways. Right, so I call it double duty data. Right, so where does that show up in this example? Right, so we have a dictionary. Its type tells us exactly the structure of what it looks like. Right, say we want to print it out. Right, so I can go to Haskell and say print this out, and it print. And this is the string that GHCI is going to print for me. What just happened? 
right? Look at this value and look at the string. <coughs> the string has more information than the value does, right? Because base is not stored in the value. It's only appearing in the type. But somehow when I said print, this is a runtime thing, sometimes when I asked to print it, I had to know what that what that is. I had to know from the type how to what to do at run. And so here we have this string here, base, that's the double duty, right? It's there to constrain how the types are have this constrain this representation, but it's also there, we also use it at runtime. We just happen to know it statically as well. Right, so this is where pi comes in to a dependently typed language. Right, if we're going to ever use something both as a type and some runtime data, we usually have a pi in a dependently typed language. Right, and so if I were to, if Haskell was officially dependently typed, um, then I might write it like this. Right, to to display to take some entry and display it. I would quantify over the two indice type indices to entry using a pi, which would allow me to take that key and show it. Right at runtime, print out something that is also being used in a type. Right? And when I show a data, when I show the data, I get that occurrence information. My type functions from before tells me what kind of type that is. Once I know what kind of type that is, I know which of these sh overloaded show operations I need to run when I produce the string representation. So I'm taking that type information as directly influencing my computation. What's the problem? There's no pi type in Haskell yet. <laughs> um, but there is something that's called singletons. There is a trick. There's a way to encode exactly like pi type. Um, and um, the, the, the idea is not that complicated. It's just you need to make a data structure that you can reuse at runtime that exactly mirrors the information that you have in the type. Right? And so that data structure, it's called a singleton. Right? It's indexed. So here's the singleton for my occurrence information. It says, if I want to use some occurrence information in a type, I can use this as in the type. But then I can also have this, this an instance <coughs> of this data structure at runtime, and I know if I have this value, I must have that value in the type, if I have this value in the terms. They ha they're very strongly connected to each other. So when I pattern match on these terms, that's going to tell me what O is, and so it's going to tell me how to resolve these overloaded show routines. All right, so the, just using the singletons, I can implement this fine. A little bit of work. I have to you know, write this extra data structure, but I still have that capability of what I needed from the Pi types. Okay, the last one. The last, the fourth component that we need when we write dependently typed programming is we have to do proofs. What? I mean, it's, it's once you start making your type language richer. Right? When your type checker runs, it needs to compare types. But now we have programs. We have much richer types. We have programs in our types. How do we know those programs are equal to each other? Program equivalence is a hard problem. Haskell compiler is really smart, but it can't do everything automatically. It's going to need a little bit of help to know why two types are equal to each other. And we call that help a proof. Right? And so look, this, is, this is a part where the program looks fairly different in Haskell than in other languages, right? Because Haskell doesn't, Haskell has a very different proof language compared to, say, Idris or Agda or Hawk, right? So, but let me show you where in this example some of these proofs come up, right? So here's my representation of what the regular expressions are. I just have a data type and um, it has, uh, constructors for different ways of constructing a regular expression, the types of the constructors, talk about the capture groups, and then in my code I have what's called smart constructors. These are just wrappers of the constructors of the data type because they do a little bit of optimization when I construct my regular expressions. 
I don't want to make trivial regular expressions. Like if somebody says sequence an empty regular expression, regular expression followed by something else, we know that's equivalent to just the something else, right? Putting an empty regular expression in front doesn't change what it's going to match. So it's a little more efficient to optimize our regular expressions as we construct them. But we have these types around, right? And so we have to make the type checker happy as we do these regular expression optimizations while we construct them, right? So the first optimization, right? So this one, this is actually pretty easy, right? So when we, when the type checker looks at this line, right, right, it has to verify all of the definitions of our seek have this type, right? And then the last one is easy, right? Because you can say it's just, you know, call the data constructor, our seek has the type that you want. So that one's easy. But these are the two that do the work, that do the optimization, right? So this says, okay, if the first one is our empty, then we know the capture group, right, must be the empty list, right? So we know that S1 is the empty list, and then we, but we don't know what S2. We don't know anything about S2, right? And we need to know that we're going to be, uh, we need to return something that is the merge of the empty list with S2, but the thing that we're actually returning just has the capture group of S2. So we need to know this equality. We need to know that if we merge the empty list with S2, we get S2. Right? And this is something Haskell can tell us right away, because our definition of merge says, if you're merging the empty list with something, you know, that's equal to just that thing. Right, so this one, we don't have to do a proof at all. Haskell does the proof for us. So this is, this is the good news. Right, okay, but what about the other ones, right? So here's some other, um, here's, a, here's another optimizing smart constructor for constructing regular expressions, right? What, when I do an R star, there are two optimizations I can do, right? So if you put a star around the empty regular expression, you're still not doing anything. That's, that, that's still easy, right? You know, you repeat nil, you get nil. And that, in that, you can also tell is true by the definition. But what about the next line, right? When you put a star around a star, you know, two stars in a row, that's the same as one star, right? We can combine them together, right? And so there, when I write this line into GHC, this is where I get a type error, right? And I get the type error that says, I couldn't tell this, right? I know S is equal to repeat of S1, and I need to know that repeat of S equals S. Right? So the type checker can't do this equality for me. And if you look at the definition, if you're just reducing things, that doesn't just fall out. Right? Right? We need to know that you know, if we repeat, repeat S1, that's the same as just doing one repeat. Repeat's item potent. It's true about this definition, but it's not obvious about the definition. Right. Haskell can't tell it directly. So how do I convince Haskell that this equality holds? Right. Well, what I'm going to do right, is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of create a type class that's going to say, OK, let's only think about descriptions of capture groups where this equality holds. Right. So I'm going to define a class that only contains these list of capture groups where the equality codes, I'm going to call them well-formed capture groups because they satisfy this particular equality, right? But then I'm going to say, how do we get these lists of capture groups to be in this class? Well, the empty one obviously satisfies that equality, right? Because we can look at the definition of repeat and Haskell can tell me, yeah, the empty, the empty list is a well-formed list of capture groups. And then if I have a list that's well-formed, and I put another thing on top, Haskell can also tell that putting another thing on top right, also satisfies just by reducing it one step. So it's kind of like doing an inductive proof, right? except I don't have to do any of the work. I just have to give the, the structure of it. And then I know I'm only going to be thinking about lists that are formed from nil and cons, everything I think about is going to be a well-formed list of capture groups. And so now when I go back to my code, if I just say not just any s, but s's that are well-formed, this constraint is going to bring this equality into scope. It's going to make it available to the type checker whenever I use it. 
And so when I get to this line here, I'm suddenly going to have this in my context. Haskell is going to know it already from this constraint, because the constraint says S is well formed. Since S is well formed, we must know repeat repeat S equals S. And that's going to give us exactly the thing it was trying to prove when we need, when we need that class. Right, so I've kind of used the type class system to, um, I've used the type class system to uh, uh, give the hints to the type checker and Haskell's put them in the right place. Right, now you might worry, okay, that was for R star. What about all your other proofs that you needed to do? Right, full disclosure, I had to do two more proofs. Here are their proofs. Right, I didn't have to change any of the code here. I just had to like add the extra properties I needed to the welcome type class. Right, and then there are the other parts that needed those properties automatically dispatched. Okay, so that was it. All right, so that is what I needed from Haskell's type system to implement this library like this, right? So I needed a way to compute what the types of the regular expressions are. I needed a way to constrain my representation of dictionaries. I needed a way to use those types both, both for constraining and for some runtime operations. And when I started writing code that worked with those constrained dictionaries and constrained regular expressions, I had a little bit of work to do to show that everything type checked. Right. So um, just to kind of like back up a little bit, I just want to observe that, you know, um, Haskell's a good fit for thinking about dependently type programming. You know, somebody asked me a, a, a while back, of, you know, why don't, why don't you make like, dependently type Java? <laughs> you know, Java's a statically typed language. Can't you just do that? And it doesn't work so well, right? Haskell, it's already, you know, it's already similar enough to these existing dependent type theories that it can bring things over, right? Already, we have Haskell computation. It's already based on the polymorphic lambda calculus, just lambda calculus, just like dependent type theories are, right? Already, we have this type system that distinguishes between pure and impure code. And the fact that we know that all the things that we're working with are pure code <coughs> gives us a direct connection to how these dependent type theories work. Right. And, but it's not exactly the same. Right? And I think the fact that Haskell is not exactly the same as these dependent type theories, that's, that's really the exciting part. Because right? then we can kind of learn about the design space of dependently type programming language. Right? Um, first of all, you know, there's a lot of people out there using Haskell. And I can, see how, not just how I take these features and use them, I can look and see how other people use them. And that also informs how I understand dependently type programming, right? Um, there's another aspect, right, which is, is proof language is really weak, so you can't, it's hard to write proofs. That kind of, that's both a blessing and a curse, right? The curse is you can't always write the proofs that you want. The blessing is then you never have to write the proofs because you can't do them anyway. Um, it really kind of pushes us into the different parts of the design space of thinking about how, you know, what is the minimal amount of proof that I need to do in order to write this code. Okay, so um, again, the code, if you want to play it with it yourself, it's available here in this GitHub repository. And I've been working on Haskell for quite some time with all these folks. I apologize for the color. Some of them are here. So please talk to me and them here today. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Uh, so your third point where you said um, we need the, the pie to sort of reflect what we have at the type level to the value mm -hmm. level. Um, I thought we could, you know, we've been doing this for, for, for a long time and there's just type classes, right? Uh, why, why do you need to uh, benefit type classes? So just type classes. Um, right, so we needed it for here. And um, so type classes, you're right, are very similar, right, in that um, it's a way of using types to 
to trigger some runtime values that, that go on. And right, and that's how like these different shows work, right? Once you know what the type is, it resolves to which computation. I needed it here though. What's what's here is a little bit different in that um, could I have done this with a type class? Probably, but I might have had to restructure everything. That's the thing about dependent types is um, there's always a way, another way to do something, right? Um, I wanted to demonstrate that if you had not planned ahead with a type class, but you had planned ahead with a singleton, you can write something that's more directly connected to the Pi idiom in dependently typed language, but maybe there's some type class way of, of writing the same operation. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have an example if you just go uh, slide back again. Okay. So in this uh, syntax uh, idea that you envisage Jane with dependent has more, if I understand correctly, the first argument here, the dependent, uh, dependent type there. Dependent this K? Dependent quantification. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the pi K. The O actually in the show data below. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, this one? Yeah, exactly. So in the implementation of the term that has that type, you're uh -huh. basically, if I understand it correctly, kind of case splitting on elements of the uh, universe of types. Is that correct? Um, I'm case splitting on things that appear both in the type dependently, so later in other types, uh, but they um, kind of, we're not doing these universes a la Tarski kind of thing. We're squashing everything together. So making fine distinctions doesn't be, really help. Because I'm trying to connect it yeah. with the Agda where I think yeah. this would not be possible, right? No, you could do this in Agda. So in Agda, this would just be pi, O would just be an element of some data type, this oh. awk data type, but you can pattern match it. And you can write functions in Agda that also pattern match to produce types. Mm. So this is totally possible So you're not quantifying over types? No, 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 I'm not quantifying over types. Okay. Now Haskell can do that, and Agda can't, okay. but it's not needed in this particular example. <coughs> yeah? Uh, if you uh, had a string that was computed, used as a regular expression, mm -hmm. would that work? Or did you say at some okay. point that this is all static? Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is going way back to the beginning. Um, right. This is all based on the fact that we have the string in the source code of the file, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, that's when the type checker runs, when it looks at the source code. Right now, um, so somewhere in that code, we have to have some kind of string literal that we can parse at compile time and then run the type checker. Now, what we do with that string, we can do all sorts of stuff with that string, right? We can, um, so we have, we have all these functions, right? We can take regular expressions that we constructed and make new regular expressions out of them, right? In, in arbitrary ways that maybe we don't quite know, but the type checker will track how we manipulate those regular expressions. And, um, and then it will use those types to calculate um, what the dictionary is going to look like. Yeah? Uh, so Haskell 98 is uh, syntax directed, right? In that yeah. You don't generally need a type uh, to write the type. Uh, when I've tried to do this kind of thing in the past, I always tend to destroy type inference in some way. Yeah. Can you say anything about that? Uh, yeah. So. Um, There. <laughs> um, we're, I'm not using Haskell 98, right? So it doesn't have complete type difference, right? And so it is really important when I do things like use um, uh, GADTs or rank end types, those work because Haskell needs some extra type information from annotations to be able to, 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 be able to do the type difference. Now all the code I've shown you where it's inferring Right. It's in the. Um, it doesn't need complete type information everywhere, right? It just needs it in some places. So, just defining what the types of these regular expressions are, using it from get field, I can do that without annotation, right? So notice, like I didn't have to write down what the type of x, it can compute it for me, right? But in certain times, like when I construct the like the the definition of the match function, I do have to have a type annotation there so it knows how it, everything works out. And do you think if we had the pi operator, we would have more or less inference? Um, 
it's not the pi operator that really causes the inference problems. It's actually the Tonger's. It's all his fault. No, the, the type level functions, which we really want, which Tonger just talked about in a great talk at ICP yesterday. Um, when we have type level functions that are, that's where we start to have real challenges with type inference, where we're going to have more, need more annotations. But it's going to work better because we're going to have more flexibility about what we can write as well. Last question. I'd like to follow up on the idea of putting a regular expression into a file. Yeah. Could I, would it be crazy to think maybe I could write a parser that would take the string from the file and yeah. would only succeed if the regular expression in the file has the type of captures that, that I specify? So what you could do, yeah, you could totally write that, that. right? Um, you can, uh, like what you're doing is sort of, you, you get this data, you get a regular expression, maybe you know, know what the captures are, but then you can write a function that would verify that a particular regular expression structure has a particular capture structure. Oh, very nice. So you yeah. can kind of decouple You could totally decouple oh, it, right? Nice. You don't even have to do the parsing and the, and the, 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 the capture uh, restriction at the same time. Great. Thank you very much.